how to manage your immune system for health and how to navigate viral and other infections in these dangerous times. Um, first of all, um, my name is Martin Patella. I am the CEO at Life Enthusiast. I'm also a health coach and I'm a CMTA that stands for Certified Metabolic Typing Advisor. Um, Certified Metabolic Typing Advisor is a um, branch of functional medicine approach to uh, understanding how the genetics and the human health intersect. We learn about foods and how our bodies are pre-selected genetically to certain diets. But that's, we're not going to talk about that today. My past education, I also was trained as a clinical hypnotherapist. And uh, in my previous incarnation, I was a, um, well, I, I have a degree in uh, computer science and business administration. I spent 20 years working in the high tech industry as a, a trainer and tech support and sales. And I lectured in various ways. How I got into health has much to do with my early in life, 25 years of age, visit at a dentist. I ended up with 12 mercury amalgam fillings. Mercury turns out to be one of the most toxic things you can put into your body. And uh, very soon after I had these 12 fillings installed, I started falling apart. I um, ended up with back pain and, uh, and plantar fasciitis and carpal tunnel syndrome. And, uh, and I evolved into allergies to pollens. And uh, it all really was starting out as the uh, breakdown of the, uh, um, of the uh, microbiome in the gut. The mercury is very toxic, and it's very toxic to the immune system, and it's toxic to, uh, well, all the systems in the body. And in my attempts to... Uh, fix myself. Well, I first went to the professionals. I went to the medical mainstream and then to the alternative, the chiropractors, the naturopaths, the osteopaths, and then further afield, all manner of therapies. Most of them focused on treating the symptoms. They're competent people. But they just are like this way. To a man with a hammer, most things look like a nail. They were following the symptoms. They were not asking, but what is the cause of this? So eventually, after about 10 years of trying, I had this moment when I realized that I was going to help, have to help myself or else spend the rest of my life in misery, declining into uh, disability. In the process of that, I started reading and studying and analyzing. And thank God I was trained as a uh, analyst, so I could figure out the hows and the whys of things. And sure enough, eventually it dawned on me that it was the mercury. So since about the year 1995, I've been working as a health coach. Since 2001, we have been online with Life Enthusiast. I have now counseled probably thousands of people. So let's talk about this the immune system, its role and purpose, and regulation challenges. How does the immune system regulate itself, and how does it all work? Well, let's, let's uh, talk about why. Why immune system? The ingress pathways. Ingress as in uh, stuff gets in. Well, first of all, the immune system is protecting us from the unwanted incoming traffic. So first of all, of course, the obvious, the cuts, the, the um, punctures and the wounds. And certainly you can see the uh, system in action. If, for example, you get a uh, cut that gets infected by some microbes, all of a sudden you will see the white blood cells congregating. They, as they die, they look like pus. 
and that's that's the uh, that's the dead bodies of the warriors that have sacrificed themselves in the fight with the external influences. The, but we we have openings, right? Like we we interact with the world. If we shut ourselves off, we become a marble statue. Life is a, exists in a dynamic balance, not in a uh, static balance. Static balance, no interaction. Dynamic balance, exchange. We cannot exist in the world without bringing things in and letting things out. So sure enough, your eyes, they are wet and they are um, allowing the... Uh, dust and whatever else come in. So if somebody spits at you, then whatever's in that droplet, including the microbes, it's arriving in your eyes and you get it. That's why we're so strongly encouraged to not put hands to our face, just as I'm doing now, sticking fingers in your eyes, because whatever's on your finger now gets into the eye. The other ingress pathway, you're breathing. So the, the lining of your nose, sinuses and the bronchi and the lungs and then of course food eating so that will be the uh, the cells in your mouth and the throat and the esophagus stomach and so on and then the sexual organs you can think of it as all of the tissues that are mucosal barriers you can see them that they're different from the skin. The skin is more resilient, more resistant, less likely to let things through. And yet, of course, we all know if we put a patch on, like a nicotine patch or a scopolamine patch, the medication gets inside. It just takes longer. When we put something under our tongue, it's a lot quicker, but it still gets into the circulation. Likewise, whatever we uh, end up with, um, like, for example, rectally, we can add uh, suppositories. They get absorbed very quickly. So what are we worried about as far as the immune system is concerned? Uh, whatever's arriving, viral, bacterial, protozoa, protozoan, those would be single cell organisms like amoebas and, and the likes, and fungal. Fungus, of course, spores of things. They can really mess things up. And of course, we should be very much worried about all the other toxic burden that gets into us on air and food and water, all kinds of dirt, herbicides, pesticides, industrial uh, toxic compounds, hydrocarbons, metals, and the likes. It's interesting how detrimental the industrial environment can be for us, especially in the cities where uh, there's a lot of traffic, Automobiles put out the exhaust and the brake pad dust is loaded with metals and the industrial enterprises that send their stuff in the air and in the water. It's a fairly dangerous place to be. I would like to explain the immune system in an analogy. I call it the nightclub, nightclub model. Like in a nightclub, for people to be having a reasonable amount of fun without hurting one another or, well, it needs to be a functioning situation. First of all, we have a doorman. Doorman is a person at the door that tries to eliminate the obvious troublemakers. So we are letting in only that which we hope to be compatible with the spirit of, on the inside. So keep out the trouble. And then on the inside, we have the bouncers and the bartenders. And the bartender is dispensing the fun stuff, but also is watching the crowd. The bartender is supposed to be only putting out so much alcohol as to not get the guests in trouble, but not so little that they would be feeling miserable about things. And bouncers walk about and they are watching for trouble. And if somebody's getting just a little too rowdy or uh, just needs to be not there, then the bouncers need to step in and take that unwanted guest out. But they need to do that efficiently without causing pain to others and without breaking up the whole 
whole place. But sometimes a fight breaks out, as we have all seen, seen in movies, and sometimes in real life, things can go out, get out of hand. So the components of the immune system that are involved in the, uh, on the inside of the club, so to speak, are listed here on the screen, white blood cells, antibodies, the complementary functions, uh, the lymphatic system, and the major organs, spleen, bone marrow, and thymus. We can discuss the details, but what I found instead is if you would like to get yourself educated about all of this, there is a fantastic resource online. It's on the Khan Academy. Anyway, so the, the, the immune system has two branches, innate and adaptive. And uh, the adaptive is the one that's learning from things that are coming in. So it's kind of naked and unprepared when we're first born. But as we go forward, it gets more and more educated. So next time you encounter something, it's going to be able to better deal with the incoming. The innate is built in. We get that from our mothers and uh, we are born with a whole bunch of memories already built in. Anyway, so going back to the, to the link, khanacademy.org, copy that, go to that link, and you can just study up on the immune system, its components and the technical details. What, what's interesting here is that in the innate system, there are these uh, basophils and eonos, eosinophils and neutrophils. And you will see that if you have a blood test, these numbers are shown on your blood test. And so if you have too little or too much of any one of these components, it will indicate that things are either in, in balance or out of balance, and uh, your doctor would be able to uh, perhaps direct you to what needs to be done. The interesting part about the immune system is that the memory can be transferred, so we can actually move some of the cells from one person to another, and the immunity can be transferred. The issue with either the underactive or the overactive system, there are some specific illnesses that relate to uh, the underactive system, genetic predispositions, certain drugs can cause these, these problems like AIDS, A-I-D-S, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. That's immune deficiency. That's, that's something that, that can happen. On, on my end, we end up dealing more with the uh, overactive immune system. And uh, the overactive system, that's, that's the bouncers in the bar being just a little too intense or the guests being too rowdy. And we end up with allergies and eczema, which is skin problems, and sinusitis, which would be a, a inflammation in the sinuses and post-nasal drip. Hives, which would be uh, skin eruptions. And, uh, well, you know what hives look like. They're red welts. Rosacea, that's a steady uh, red glow on the skin. And then on top, immune disorders. They are part of this overactive misdirected immune system with illnesses that include multiple sclerosis, diabetes, arthritis, thyroiditis, lupus, vasculitis. There are about 200 different defined illnesses. The mainstream medical system likes to name things after geography. They, they don't really concern themselves much with what's causing things, but where they show up. So they'll have a name for an illness that's uh, got to do with your eyes and your mouth or your thyroid or your heart instead of by what caused it. What's interesting is the, um, the regulatory uh, system. The TH cell, the T helper cell, there are these two main sides to it. And uh, one side can be dominant over the other. And one is siding with the acquired system and the other one siding with the uh, learned system. And as you can see on the screen, in one group, the Th1 dominant conditions, 
that includes type 1 diabetes and multiple sclerosis and Hashimoto's thyroiditis and Crohn's disease, psoriasis, Sjogren's, celiac, rheumatoid arthritis. That would be from one side of the system being overactive, whereas in the other one, things like eczema and lupus and asthma and allergies and ulcerative colitis would be the other group. And what's interesting is we can actually do quite a bit to uh, modify and control things because certain supplements and certain types of foods are stimulating either one side or the other. And so what we want is that if the uh, TH1 is dominant, we want to eat less foods that are stimulating the TH1 and more foods that are stimulating the TH2. So as you can see here on the slide, the TH1 stimulants will include uh, echinacea and licorice and ginseng and grapeseed extract, whereas the TH2 stimulants will include things like pine bark and uh, lycopene and curcumin and quercetin. And so you can try to um, help balance the system. And you can define for yourself and figure out for yourself what is better for your situation. Not all things are right for all people, and things can change in time. You may end up with a situation that calls for the TH2s to be uh, supplemented, and, um, and at times the other side. So you can come back to this and learn more about it. And you can research more and you can call us to uh, get more grounded in the, what's going on for me. So how do we get into the sick state? How do we get into the broken and uh, less well-functioning state? Wouldn't you know it? The worst of it or the biggest contributor is stress. It's not what happens out there, but how we react to it. Like people are saying stress, 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 blaming it on the outside, but really it's the inside. It's not what happens, but it's what you do. You can choose to react with horror and panic, or you can choose to be more rational about it. Meditation is a really important tool for centering the mind, quiet, quieting the mind, and uh, finding a better way of dealing with stress. And of course, sleep. Sleep is the time when we repair. It's not a, um, it's not a wasted time. I don't know, but when I was a kid, people were talking about wanting to not sleep so that they live more. The truth is, we need the sleep. The sleep is the time when we fix things that have been worn or, or overstressed. There are these two sides to the autonomic nervous system, um, sympathetic and parasympathetic. The sympathetic, the fight or flight, helps us deal with threatening inputs, and that's the stress side. The parasympathetic, also known as the uh, rest, repair, and digest, is the side with which we repair things. So you cannot be both. You cannot be sleeping and acting at the same time. And you cannot be repairing and running away from danger at the same time. The other big contribution to uh, how well we function in this world has to do with stagnation. The lymphatic fluids or the fluids in the body other than the blood don't have a natural pump. Your blood is pumped by the heart. Well, the heart is much more than just a pump, but at least there is this force that drives the blood around through the circuitry, the, the arteries and the veins. But the lymphatic fluid, which is extracellular, does not have a pump. The only time it gets moved is when you, the body, moves up and down against gravity. That's why walking is so beneficial, and that's why using something like a mini trampoline or a vibration plate, vibrating plate, is so beneficial to the human body. And then the third biggest contributor to a malfunctioning immune system would be the toxic burden. 
the more toxic we are, the more chance there is that we're blocking the normal function, the normal expression of things. Your body tends to sequester, hide, put away things that it cannot get rid of. So if you inhale something, maybe coughing is the way of trying to get rid of it or, or sneezing. And of course, we eliminate things through the skin. So skin breakouts, or at least sweating, uh, is an important part of the pathways. And of course, urine and uh, feces are really important. So regular uh, bowel movements are a requirement and drinking enough so that your urine is running clear, not, not colored. It shouldn't be smelly and it shouldn't be anything other than very pale, pale color. So I mentioned the mucosal barrier a little earlier in this uh, presentation, but let's get back to it. So this is the lining of your nose and your lungs, your mouth and the guts and urethra and the reproductive canal. The resilience of the uh, mucosal barrier, its ability to resist the ingress, the, the transition of things that shouldn't get through the barrier, is very much dependent on nutrients. Iodine is really, really important. It's the shield mineral. When you you hear that thyroid, uh, that iodine is important for your thyroid, and it is. The thyroid uses about two thirds of all the iodine in the body. But having abundance of iodine is really important in being able to resist the transgressions things getting across the barrier that shouldn't. Zinc is also important. We need to have enough zinc in the uh, trace mineral, you know, 50, 25 to 50 minute milligrams of zinc every day is all it takes, but that's required. By the way, if you see these white spots on your nails, they look like little uh, hits of white, those are indicating that there is a deficiency of zinc happening in your body for sure. Lecithin is another really important component. Lecithin is the universal emulsifier in the human body. So it's a lubricant, it makes things more resilient, um, and it helps the uh, transport of all things fat soluble, or all things fat, in the transport systems of the human body. Both blood and the lymph are water-based systems and you already know that water and oil don't mix. You need some kind of a detergent to have those two connect. And lecithin is that detergent. So it helps us move things from wherever they may be hidden out to where we want them. As I mentioned, the, uh, the toxic burden Lecithin is one of the means by which we are able more efficiently to move things out. Gut health is really important. 80% of the immune system resides at the interface between the uh, lining of the gut and the blood system, just outside of the dangerous zone. <clears throat> if you can think of your mouth, as the opening to the outside world. In fact, the tube that runs between your mouth and your anus is actually the outside running through the middle of you. And we should allow only the desirable things to get through the barrier. And the desirable things are the nutrients. They are the fully decomposed foods, amino acids. So if the lining of the gut is damaged, if the uh, microbiome that lives within that tube isn't well balanced, you will experience problems. So we need to be uh, seeing balance of probiotics and prebiotics. Prebiotics is what feeds the probiotics. The probiotics is essentially the microbes. And they like humic and fulvic acid as the terrain to live in and uh, it helps them communicate. And they need fiber to fiber, especially mucopolysaccharides, inulin is the food that the microbes need to, to feed themselves. It doesn't feed us, it feeds them. 
And then there are herbs that will uh, tonify this process. We can speed things up, slow things down. And uh, my last note on the uh, gut health is to eliminate foods that make things worse. Industrial foods, food-like substances. We have the chemical industry feeding the uh, agro industry that's growing food-like substances that are not necessarily food anymore. The worst culprits, wheat. Ever since they hybridized the wheat, I think it was about 1970s when they uh, started producing the uh, high gluten wheat. It used to be like 6% gluten, 6% protein. Now it's to about 12 or 13. It was seen as a huge advance, a victory. Well, it turns out that many, many people are at least sensitive, if not downright allergic to this gluten. And dairy, homogenization of the dairy is forcing the fat through a teeny microscopic uh, holes that causes the globules of fat to disperse. It, it makes them so tiny that they actually can get through this mucosal barrier, which makes the dairy you know, get into the bloodstream, problems ensue. So we find that the two most allergy-producing allergy foods are gluten and dairy. That's why I put them on this, on this list. The other major pathway, lungs, a lot of dust particles that we shouldn't get into the lungs are are there because the ionization of the air is off balance. Negative ions help the dust to settle out, to drop out of the air. You would probably notice that uh, among trees, in parks and forests, uh, breathing is le easier and it feels wonderful, peaceful, relaxed. The opposite of what you experience uh, indoors. The indoor air is usually on the positive ionization, whereas the forest air is somewhere in the negative ionization territory. So to whatever degree you can spend time in the forest, the more the merrier. And if you can install negative ion generators in your indoor space, do it. And air filters will help, of course, to filter out particles. So if you have issues, well, everybody has issues, some people worse than others. By removing the particles from the air, you're going to make it easier on yourself. Air filters is a good idea. We also are finding that uh, there's a lot of microbes in the air. The microbes don't breathe the way we do. They process oxygen through an enzymatic pathway. And uh, it's been found that silver in its ionic form is capable of disabling the enzyme that the microbes use to take in oxygen. When we do that, we are actually disabling their ability to proliferate, to grow, to reproduce. So you will find us promoting ionic silver. The other name for this product is colloidal silver. Colloidal means that the, there are teeny blobs of silver, small enough that they are floating in water. But off of these tiny blobs, the ions of silver are sloughing off into the water, and it's the ions that are reacting with the, uh, with the microbes. We promote ionic silver and have that available, and uh, when you spray that, you can spray that in your mouth, in your lungs, inhale it, broadcast it with uh, a humidifier or a nebulizer, it all effectively stops the growth of viral, bacterial, and fungal infections. The other way we have is ROS, reactive oxygen species. You would know that ozone is used to sterilize and neutralize microbes. Ozone is the most aggressive form of oxygen. You can also get that from hydrogen peroxide or from oxybleach. But those things are too aggressive. You cannot put them in contact with human cells. Uh, 
But what you can do is you can have this ROS, reactive oxygen species, that is non-toxic to the human cell, and you can put that into circulation. And this, this ingredient called biohydrox, we have that available in a product called Amazing Soak. Soak, S-O-A-K, soaking in the tub. Amazing Soak, you can add it also into a humidifier or nebulizer and broadcast it through the air. And as you inhale it, it will shut off or block the uh, viral or bacterial infections the same way as bleach would, without harming you. Well, anyway, <clears throat> viral infections, they're upon us, right? We are dealing with viral infections every year, just this year more so than others. One needs to be concerned how they transmit. Some viruses are transmitted through air, like mumps, I think, is one of them that will float in the air for days. Or um, there are droplets of saliva, or some are only transmitted when you exchange fluids. Lately, we have been discussing the rate of infection, just how many people uh, an infected person will pass it on to. Like the common flu is one person will infect one other, or maybe one and a half. The latest, the, the newest coronavirus that seems to in, be much faster, one person will infect multiple people before, uh, before you even know that you have it. That causes the infection to spread really fast. The incubation, how long it takes before we have symptoms. What's really interesting is this. Let's just say that you just got infected. A droplet, just one little droplet with just some viruses got transferred into your nose. And it doubles every day. Well, it takes some time to grow in size to be significant. It may take 10 days, 14 days before it's large enough that your immune system all of a sudden has to now go all out with fever and coughing and all kinds of symptoms that, uh, that are significant. But you have had that infection in your body all this time. So had you been using something like the, uh, say, silver to block the replication, you would never get out of the initial infection stage through the incubation into the active. And then, then we deal with the symptoms. Some are upper respiratory and some are through the skin, like you will see viral infections that will cause um, skin rashes and blisters and whatnot, like the uh, chicken pox or, well, other. There are many many different illnesses that we all have encountered. And then finally, the severity. And that, that really depends on the person and how their immune system is reacting. Well, let's, let's just get to the specifics. This coronavirus that started as SARS somehow mutated, whether it was a natural reaction or the bats, as the story goes, or some military experiment gone silly. We don't know yet how it started. All we know is that it's very infectious, easily transmissible, and uh, it can cause significant problems. So this COVID-19 comes in through the eyes, nose, or mouth and busts through the ACE2 receptors, angiotensin. So people who are on ACE inhibitor drugs, people with uh, heart conditions, they are going to get affected faster than others. And so what happens is if, if indeed your body is having a hard time keeping it at bay and shutting it down, it goes into this uh, cytokine storm. I'll discuss that in a moment. But the cytokine storm, cytokine storm is essentially the immune system going into overdrive, overreacting. This is the uh, bouncer inside the bar going a bit crazy. The natural ways of dealing with this, of, with lung infection, is coughing. We're trying to just expel stuff that's in the lungs out through the coughing, like forced air leaving, right? <coughs> just like that. The other ways 
is to bake it with heat. Most viruses are quite fragile. You can actually disable them by increasing the body temperature. One of the um, tools that people have recommended is using sauna, going into a hot air sauna. The viruses are disabled at about 133 Fahrenheit, 56 Celsius. So if you have the ability to go to a sauna every day, this is not the little sauna tent that you're sitting in. You need to be into the hot air sauna that you're breathing the hot air. If you can do 20 minutes of really hot air, you're likely to stay well, even if you have been infected. So um, I guess it's a question of immunity, right? If you've had previous exposure, as in you have immunity through having encountered it, meaning this, once you have had chickenpox, you're not going to get it the second time because your body already knows how to deal with the chickenpox. Once you've had coronavirus, your body knows how to deal with it. The problem with the flu and the uh, uh, upper respiratory viruses is that they are mutating quite fast. That actually is the downfall of the uh, flu shot. The, uh, the medical industry is trying to create a vaccine in which they are speculating what the next season might look like. So they will put certain species of the viruses into the flu shot, hoping that it's going to be the ones that are coming. But they cannot predict the mutation. So when the mutated version arrives, we have no immunity to that. The only way we can deal with it is go through the exposure. So a healthy young person without medical challenges will go through the infection, the immune system will react to it, develop immunity to it, and shut it down. Unfortunately, a challenged person will not have such luck. They will have a very difficult time defeating the infection. That's where the vaccination story comes in. We all are hoping that uh, we could get vaccinated for this thing that's coming. I personally think that that's not going to ever work because the mutations continue. And even if I get vaccinated to or against the stuff that happened last year, this next coming season is going to come with variations and mutations, and I still will be unprepared. That's why you see these numbers like this season's flu shot was 40% effective. As in, 40% of what was coming was covered and 60% was not. So I, I don't think that that's going to be the avenue that's going to work out in the long run. I believe that a better way to deal with immunity is to strengthen the microbiome. Make sure that the uh, microbes living within us, and, and that would be in the nose and in the mouth and in the gut, all of them are in good balance and that the mucosal barrier is well-maintained and strong. There goes the recommendation for iodine and zinc and lecithin. And then finally, figuring out how to not be stressed. I don't know if listening to the news gets you stressed, but maybe it might be smarter to find some way to not be attached to the outcomes. So here's, here's how we deal with viral infections. Of course, the prevention is best, right? Avoiding the exposure. This is, what, this is what the latest strategy has been. Because we have no effective response to, to the infection itself, the avoidance is the best we can do. No contact, right? Because this COVID-19 is transmitted, transmitted by talking to one another from too close, because as I, every time I say the letter P and T and whatever, I can just feel the air coming out of my mouth with force. And it'll, it'll get in the air, and if you're close enough, you're going to pick it up. Or it will hit the surface of the uh, whatever I'm, I'm in front of. Uh, imagine a bank counter or store counter. 
if I'm standing there and talking and I'm not wearing a mask, it's going to be on that surface. So the next person that comes by and touches it and then puts their fingers in their face, their nose, their mouth, their eye, they're going to get infected from what I left behind. So avoiding the exposure is very good. There has been a lot of discussion whether face masks should be worn. By face mask, even a cloth, right? Even a uh, um, scarf in front of the face, bandana, um, or any, any facial covering. The way it works is I'm not protecting me by wearing it. I'm protecting you. Because when I have something in front of my face, my spit is not going to end up on the counters and not in the air. So by wearing the masks, I'm protecting you. And by you wearing it, you're protecting me. That's how this works. It's a mutual protection. We need to wash hands because hands are the most common way to uh, pick it up from surfaces. Let's just say that I ended up uh, getting a box of something and uh, that box has, like even cardboard will have uh, droplets of somebody's breath on it that will be active for a couple of days. So if I touch it, I need to wash my hands before I touch my face with my hands. So wash your hands frequently. And then now, how do we block the reproduction? We do have the tools. So as I mentioned, we have the silver. We can spray the silver on the surfaces. We can spray the silver into the mouth and nose. Iodine works effectively by strengthening the mucosal barrier. You can gargle with a, uh, an ounce of water with six drops of iodine tincture in it. It'll kill off whatever, sterilize whatever is in there right now. Humic acid and fulvic acid, they are helping to uh, strengthen the, uh, the mucosal barriers, especially in the gut. The biohydrox or our amazing soak. You can broadcast that, um, spray it in, also very effective. All of these things are effective at blocking the virus's ability to reproduce. And um, herbs, especially oregano, the P73 oregano has been studied against the SARS. I don't think that there is a current study on the COVID-2 or SARS-2. But if it worked on the previous version of the SARS, there's a good chance that it works on this one. So the oregano is good as well. So now that was the prevention, right? So if we manage the prevention and if we manage to stop it from growing, we're good. We never reach the really sick stage. But some people do reach the sick stage, the cytokine storm, which essentially is brought on by overacting, overreacting immune system. It's sending too many defenses. It's overproducing the immune cells and the signaling cells, that's the cytokines. And so as it's just piling on, piling on, it's like a runaway train, like an avalanche. Um, and because too many of these cells are arriving, it's creating fluid buildup, especially in the lungs, the lower lungs. So that gives the respiratory distress. And now in that fluid, there's a secondary problem, which is the uh, pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia. The bacteria are in the environment all the time. They would not normally grow because the lungs are managed to stay dry. But now that they're over, overfilled with fluids, now the bacterial culture start growing. So what needs to happen is we need to essentially find a way to slow down the immune reaction. Now the doctors are prescribing um, antibiotics to deal with the bacterial, inf bacterial infection, but we can actually get to it ahead of time before this stage by slowing down the uh, overreaction of the immune system. And that's um, accomplished with supplementing vitamin D3. You need about 10 to 20,000 units of D3 
not just one or two. By the way, 15 minutes of sunshine on your body is worth about 10,000 IUs. So 20, 30, 40 minutes a day of full exposure is what you need. Fish oil that gives you vitamin D as well and vitamin A. And capsaicin, that's the, uh, that's the alkaloid that makes the uh, chili peppers hot. So hot sauce in any form is going to help to shut down the immune system. And uh, licorice and aloe vera, those are tonifying the immune system to be less intense. So um, at Life Enthusiast, we have uh, tools. You can see the uh, link here on the screen. We will also add it to the show notes. And um, I want to tell you, you know, the vitamin C provides the immune system with the uh, excess electrons that the body needs. Humic acid improves the microbiome terrain in the gut. The silver is helping blocking the reproduction, the amazing soak, that's the uh, biohydrox, that's also helping the body to block the growth of the viral infections. And the um, omega resp is the um, respiratory oregano. We have put together a, um, a discount for those who are listening here today. Uh, the code is uh, IMM. W-E-B for immunity and webinar. So if you use the code I-M-M-W-E-B, you will be able to get 10% off on products that are in this cold flu and immunity category on the Life Enthusiast website. We can support you and we can make it more cost efficient and, uh, and effective. If you have any questions, you can reach us by phone. 866-543-3388 or um, on the website, life-enthusiast.com.